for our next speaker. Uh, I can't remember who that is. Um, um, thank you so much for, uh, for sitting down and listening and staying all these days. I know it's a packed program. I have prepared about 75 slides. Uh, um, no, uh, but I really appreciate that you're here. It's, um, it's really great to see that the interest has grown so much in, uh, in our space um, and that there's so much also industry coming, really driving, I think, innovation. So my lab is really interested in understanding the sort of basic uh, mechanisms of aging. What's the molecular basis of the phenotypes that we see as we get old? So why do we develop graying of hair? Why do we develop uh, facial wrinkles and uh, redistribution of subcutaneous fat, pigmentation changes, and all of these phenotypes that occur with aging? And so uh, in this paper, we, uh, in, in this particular paper, we, we summarize some of the prevalences of features that you see with aging. So basically, we downloaded PubMed, and then we um, found features that were associated with aging. Okay, so graying of hair is by far the most prevalent feature that we, or is the most prevalent feature that we see in aging. So almost everybody developed graying of hair. So in essence, graying of hair, I think, could be considered a sort of a universal biomarker of aging. Uh, of course, there are other things, so almost everybody developed muscle weakness. So this is if you, if you just look at an elderly population, what is the prevalence of features? There are more uh, serious features. Cancer occurs to about 40% and dementia uh, occurs to maybe between 10 and 20% depending on, on um, the literature. All right, we can also derive phenotypes from healthcare records. So this is one of the oldest uh, healthcare records in existence. This is uh, a, uh, a healthcare record from Egypt that describe, uh, I think, tumors in, and I think there's also something about broken legs around. I don't know. I can't. I can't read hieroglyphs, um, but uh, someone tells me it's a healthcare record. Okay, uh, we've fortunately gotten access to um, a large number of healthcare records. So we we have mined 33 million pathology records um, from Denmark. Um, and um, these are records where you have a detailed description of what a pathologist actually sees in the microscope. So it's basically the pathologist's view of what's, on, what's in that tissue, right? And so doing this, we can, get, we can generate a clinical feature matrix. So in one report, we can see was neoplasia mentioned, was granuloma mentioned, was macrophages mentioned, lymphocytes, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have uh, about 10,000 different features and about 33 million records. So it's a relatively large matrix. <clears throat> but when you have a matrix like that, then you can do different uh, bioinformatics uh, approaches. So uh, I think this is a TSNE. It might be a UMAP. I actually can't remember. I think it's a TSNE, uh, where we have, um, where we have uh, looked at uh, the age normalized terms and how they associate with each other. And we can see that sort of uh, the, the colors are added later. And so the, um, the terms that are associated with sort of youth uh, are sort of more central. But then the terms sort of really distribute in all directions. So it's like a chaotic process. It's not like one directional. It sort of goes... Uh, in many directions. So we can also do another type of uh, dimensionality reduction. So this is a principal component analysis here where we have just looked at um, so uh, normalized all terms to a single age. So this is from zero to 100. And then we can see that there is definitely a progression of aging that goes something like this. All right, and you can, you can look at just the age effect on one component, where you see that there's a developmental effect here. And then aging on, on principal component one here seems to be rather constant. And then very late, there is maybe a second phase of aging. On principal component two, we also see, we see a more constant effect that starts around 20. So this is a principal component of all the features in the matrix. We also looked at how, how fast does aging progress, so the distance between dots. 
and you can see there's very fast progression in development. And then there's like a hump around middle age, and then it goes really fast again when you get very old. The, the change in variance, so to speak. So because we saw that hump, maybe we thought there was something with menopause around uh, mid-age. But in fact, uh, so we, we separated in females and males, but actually we see this, the hump in both females and males. Um, we, we heard from Tony Wiscarius about this three waves of aging previously. And maybe there is also sort of a three waves of, uh, of aging in, in our data set here. What we can see from females is, uh, if you look at principal component one, you have this, um, this um, um, age effect or developmental effect, and then aging or aging has little effect on principal component one until very, very late. On principal component two, on the other hand, it appears that the age effect actually starts uh, actually late teens, around 19 of age, and then it sort of progresses slowly uh, this way. Principal component two represents about 25% of the entire variance in that data set. Uh, but if we look at uh, males, on the other hand, we can see that principal component one is relatively flat uh, and um, maybe starts a little bit later, but then progresses faster and has a much stronger, there's a much larger effect um, of, of aging on, um, on um, principal component one. So um, females age maybe a little bit earlier and slower, males age a little bit later and then we drop off a cliff, unfortunately. Okay, we can also look at uh, different uh, tissue-specific aging trajectories. Uh, so we can see, for example, in the lung, aging looks like this, has this uh, interesting L shape. I guess the point here is that there is somewhat a gradual progression in lung aging. Because we have uh, also actually survival data for, for these individuals, we can uh, um, add a hazard ratio to each single term, which means that every, like the 10,000 terms in the data set actually represent 10,000 biomarkers of survival include, and biomarkers of aging, of course. So this is really a massive and data set. Some tissues are kind of very linear, so liver seems to just age along like this very sort of linear path. There's others that are quite strange. So kidney has this sort of um, aging that goes this way and then it returns and goes back and becomes uh, and, and goes like this. So there are definitely tissue specific aging features. So we can also do age prediction from, uh, from terms. This is using a deep neural network. You get a mean absolute error of 7.6 years. So it's not great, but at least there's a signal. Um, we wanted to understand um, if there are different, if we can enrich for specific topics that are associated with aging, instead of looking at single terms, we can find topics, clusters of words that are associated with aging. And so we, we did something called topic modeling that uh, Michael, who did it, will tell you more about. I can't really, uh, this is beyond my uh, knowledge. But uh, we can do topic modeling to, in a way, cluster words, and then we can figure out which cluster contributes more to aging. So one of these clusters is this pulmonary aging cluster, this green one, which has a quite steep um, uh, regression line uh, and consists of these types of features, fibrosis, inflammation, and, and so forth. So this is all uh, very interesting. But how can we, so my lab really tries to develop interventions. How can we go from here to interventions? And one way we do that is uh, then to take these terms that are associated with aging, and then we can map them onto other data sets. So here we're mapping them onto PubMed uh, and combining that with the um, PubChem database also to find uh, abstracts where there is a um, drug, where that drug is associated with young terms, so to speak. So we, we did this, we uh, screened many thousands of uh, compounds. One of them is this nintetanib which is um, among the top 50. And the ones that are above, I think it's a 35, the ones above there, there's some uh, 
because it's the PubChem database, there are all kinds of molecules, oxygen and all kinds of stuff. Um, so, so this looked like an interesting drug. We tested it for, um, for effects on cellular senescence using a senescence predictor, I will tell you about it in a second. And instead of the reduced uh, cellular senescence, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Another tyrosine kinase inhibitor, axitinib, did not reduce senescence. Looking at the effect of this drug in senescent cells, we see that reduced collagen metabolism and wound healing, which are probably involved in this sort of pathological lung aging. And then we tested it in, uh, in fruit flies where it actually extends lifespan. So you can uh, read about it here. You can also talk to Michael Benestra. He's, he's got a, a lot more hair since this uh, picture, but he's sitting down there. He also has a poster. So this is the basic overview of that story. We're also looking at whether or not we can find patterns of aging in tissues. And so um, one way we one way we're doing this is to look at nuclear morphology in aging. And so we know in, in premature aging diseases, for example, that, there, that the nuclear envelope is convoluted. Um, it gets folded up. And there are some reports that that also happens in aging, in particular cellular senescence. So we actually developed a senescence predictor that can predict cellular senescence based on the nuclear morphology. And we applied that to, for example, uh, human fibroblasts where we can see that, uh, that uh, fibroblasts from individuals with Hodgkin's progeria syndrome, they have higher predicted senescence. The same is the case with the taxid langutatia patients and Cochrane syndrome patients. This also works when we go into mice. So in, in astrocytes, we see higher predicted senescence. In neurons, we see higher predicted senescence. Uh, and uh, we can also use it in tissues. So here we are running a deep neural network that digs out the nuclei from this H and E stained liver. And then you can predict cellular senescence uh, based on the shape of the nuclei. And so we can see that the different morphometrics, so nuclei become more elongated with age. Um, and we get more predicted senescence in the liver of these mice with age, both uh, replicative uh, senescence and ionizing radiation induced senescence predicted. <clears throat> and so, um, we went into humans and then found that did the same thing in skin biopsy from humans. And here we have um, a good understanding of what uh, health effects they had later on. This is from a, a biobank of pathological samples. And so we get a wide spectrum of, of senescence. And um, we can see that there are people that seem to have very much senescence and people that have very little senescence both when we talk replicative associated senescence and ionizing radiation induced senescence. So we were thinking, what are these people up here? Do they have, uh, are they more sick? And to our surprise, we found that it actually turns out that people that have a very low amount of senescence have an increased risk of developing cancer. So this really suggests that senescence, uh, and that was by far the strongest signal actually, uh, suggesting that senescence has a strong impact on, on uh, cancer. <clears throat> Recently, we have applied this to more than 4,000 normal biopsies from, from uh, women, from the breast of women. Um, so the, this is before uh, women develop any pathologies, okay? And then we basically did the same thing. We, here we we also have a step where we do tissue segmentation so we can identify adipose tissue, um, epithelial tissue, and co uh, connective tissue. <clears throat> and we find uh, with uh, one predictor um, that um, if we look at the fat and look at, at this predictor and combine it with the gold standard of, of, uh, of risk stratification of women, we can use this predictor to with quite uh, significant and um, get a high uh, hazard ratio, predict who would in the future develop cancer. And so this is very important because more than a million biopsies are taken every year for women that take mammograms. The, the vast majority of these, or the largest portion of these are fortunately not malignant, uh, which means that all of those 900,000 tissue samples every year are kind of discarded, right? Because 
that's just, it, it looked normal, right? But now we actually have a predictor where we can tell something about what's the risk of future cancer development. We have also applied it in a, in a study in Ethiopia, actually, where we have looked at uh, people living in highland and lowlands because we were interested in, in hypoxia. Does hypoxia induce senescence in humans? So chronic hypoxia, people living in 2,000 meters uh, above sea level. Um, do they have less senescence in their blood? And we use blood smears here. And we can see that in monocytes and lymphocytes, the highland dwellers appear to have lower predicted senescence. And we're now correlating that with their health status. All right, so we're moving into uh, uh, more and more into clinical trials. So I'm just going to give you a quick uh, snapshot of, uh, of two uh, trials that we have finished. So one of them is it's a trial on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So this is a, one of the leading causes of death globally. This is smoker's lung. Uh, we know that uh, smoking induces DNA damage, and DNA damage can drive uh, PARP activation, which may contribute to some of the inflammatory uh, issues that you see in the lung of these patients. <clears throat> and I've done a lot of work previously looking at PARP. So we found a while ago that PARP um, these power activation leads to loss of NAD and then some metabolic changes. So we wanted to, um, to treat COP, COPD patients with NR, this compound that can increase NAD levels. And this is in a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. So it's a quite nice uh, design. And what we found was that, first of all, that, that uh, NAD levels are lower in uh, in, in COPD patients, and the, um, the, the level of NAD that the patients have in their blood actually correlates with their lung function. Our primary outcome measure was IL-8, and when we give uh, placebo, we reduce IL-8, both at post, or particular at post level, and that tends to return to normal at follow-up. The ones that gain the most from, from NR are actually individuals that have the the highest IL-8 to begin with, so um, NR appears to be able to dampen that response there. And so downstream effect of, uh, of IL-8 is the recruitment of neutrophils to the lung of the patients. Uh, and we also see fewer neutrophils in the lung. And this is actually, this is sputum sample, so this is a quite uncomfortable uh, sample. You get them to inhale some uh, liquid and then they cough up pieces of their lung, more or less. So we can also look at the cells that, that they cough up, and then we can run our senescence predictor on the cells. And we find that um, at immediately after the treatment, we don't actually see an effect on, on the amount of senescent cells, but later on there is a um, significant reduction in senescent cells compared to, uh, compared to um, the placebo. And this is significant for, for IR-induced senescence and non-significant for regulative senescence. And I can't remember what that is, so I'll skip it. <laughs> All right. We also done uh, RNA-seq on the epithelial of, in the, uh, of, of these patients. And I just want to point out this area down here that the COPD patients that are treated with, with NR seem to have a reduction in, in some immune uh, inflammatory pathways. All right, so NR seems to reduce airway uh, senescence and inflammation in COPD patients. And this was spearheaded by uh, Christopher Norheim. Um, and I'll just very quickly uh, tell you about our slow age trial. And this is spearheaded by Maunus Berlin. You guys, uh, he's standing over there. He's one of our bouncers here. Uh, and uh, so we did a trial with 80 individuals where we randomized them into four different groups uh, to do exercise, giving them NR for NAD boosting, and also treating them with time-restricted fasting. And so I'm just going to give you a very, very small uh, snapshot of what we see. So the, the individuals on in time-restricted fasting, we actually see quite very significant drop in, in fat mass over the 12 weeks. And uh, we don't see much effect with, we don't see a significant effect with the other uh, measures. Uh, one thing to highlight is that we do see 
at, at loss of uh, muscle mass, although it's not significant when you compare it to the uh, controls. It's, we definitely always have to consider this if we are doing time-restricted feeding. Um, we see um, a significant drop in IL-6 with NR. They did have, the NR group for some reason had a slightly higher level of IL-6 to begin with, so maybe it's a normalization, it could also be real. What's interesting is that when we do predicted blood age, so this is using the aging AI algorithm that Alex uh, developed, um, we see that we have a very uh, pronounced effect, age associated effect. So the older you are, the more, um, the, the more you get from, from, uh, from doing time restricted feeding. Okay, but you have to be careful because maybe you're also losing muscle mass. All right, to sum up, we have thousands of biomarkers of aging. I mean, the text-based stuff is part of it. Of course, we have all the other biomarkers. We have interventions that can be used to, to see if we can influence aging. And at least the biomarkers of aging, we can actually do something about. So I think the, the, the point here is that we have interventions and we need to test them. We need to test as many as possible. And we need to show that we can do it in humans. And with that, I will stop. Oh, one more thing. Uh, we have started a Nordic aging network uh, with a number of uh, people around the Nordics. Um, and if you're from the Nordics and you're interested in aging, you could join the Nordic aging network. And with that, I will stop. Thank you so much. And I'm introducing myself, so if anybody has any questions. My, what's, what happened to my co-organizers? <laughs> okay, maybe we should just skip and go to the next speaker then. I have a question. Okay, there's a question, okay. Um, you showed all these, you saw these graphs. Wait, just talk. It's on, yeah. You showed these graphs dropping when people get really old, um, screening all the data sets that are available in the, uh, the Danish public healthcare system. Did you ever think about correlating them with healthcare expenditure per person? So you can, like, uh, we just heard the minister talking. It would be a nice way of allocating resources if you can predict what a person would cost the down most. the line, showing biomarkers, um, like, in the, in the uh, aging, aging into, uh, a, uh, uh, what's it called, senility. That's an interesting possibility. I mean, we don't really do like uh, health economics, but I think this is a good point and somebody should do it. Um, I think we will see very strong effects, I'm sure. Be able to stratify better. Yeah. I think I should stop. So, no, no, oh, no, no, no. Oh, there's not. Where? So, uh, you've mentioned that females uh, age earlier but slower and males um, age later and faster. Um, why? Can you explain <laughs> <laughs> some evolutionary concepts, why that happened? Yeah, so we speculate a little bit about that in the paper, and this is, you know, pure speculation. One idea is that, um, that if you have competition between males, um, maybe a successful male would be able to give more genes, pass more genes on to to females, um, because a male, in, in essence, can, I guess, impregnate many females if it's a really successful. So that's, that's sort of the, the evolutionary idea. Um, and I mean, it fits, so uh, I think, you know, way back in the days, people lived to be around 40, so that, that kind of fits with where, um, where you would have um, sort of a, a hard cutoff, maybe for males, when you are competing and dying in the, in the jungle. <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that's a hypothesis. I, I mean, I, this is a one possibility, right? Otherwise, I don't have any explanation. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.